We come to Paris today with a heavy heart, but with hope. We come to Paris today not to reinforce the divisions of the past, the orders of the past, but we come to Paris to identify the common humanity that we share and the absolute moral imperative to save our planet and to make it livable. We don't need a lot more words today. And quite honestly, I don't know that I have it in me to give more words. As I speak to you, my country, that of St. Vincent and the Grenadines and others in the Caribbean, in the Eastern Caribbean, are under a tropical storm watch for tropical storm Beth, literally. Yesterday, I had to decide whether to stay or to go. And I chose to stay because it is important that we move to action. Behind Tropical Storm Beth is another system. And hence, this is our new reality. We have heard this morning from Vanessa. We've heard from The Economist. We've heard from the President of Niger. And everyone has spoken truth with feeling, with clarity. And Emmanuel, I've left you for last because privately I call this the How Dare You Summit. How dare you? How dare you upset the order? How dare you step out of your crease and summon us all to this inflection moment that will determine whether we will have the capacity and the will to bring pace and scope to the problem. I can tell you that there has been movement. Yes, nine months ago, no one was speaking about natural disaster clauses. Now we have people wanting to recognize the wisdom of it because countries do need to pause debt payments if they are going to house and feed people who are victims of a climate crisis. Doesn't quite work as well for those who have to move people who are suffering from drought as the president of Malawi has had to do. So we need to perfect it. Nine months ago, no one was talking about multilateral development bank reform at scale. And Ajay, the World Bank was not as forceful in its commitment to the crisis of climate as it is now. And we wish you all the best because in your hands lies the need for pace and scope. Nine months ago, we were not prepared to discuss issues of debt. And Kristalina, when no one else was stepping up during the pandemic, yes, you led the way. Recognizing that your duty was not only to deal with the symptoms of the balance of payments problems, but to go back to the treaty and its underlying objective of securing growth and macro and financial and economic stability. But what is required of us is not simply to mark a card for progress. As we heard from Vanessa, what is required of us now is absolute transformation and not reform of our institutions. And that transformation is required because while the world knew since the 1890s that we were facing the warming of the climate, 
We chose not to heed the advice of scientists. And that which could have been done in more than a century is now being reduced to be done in less than a decade. And Secretary General, my heart bleeds for you. Because yours has been almost that constant voice in the wilderness. But I say to you that it has not been in vain. As you heard from President Macron this morning, there is now the beginning of the understanding that poverty and climate cannot be separated. That education and climate cannot be separated. And later today we will go into the details of what that action must look like much of which we have put in the Bridgetown Initiative, not because we believe we have the answers alone, but simply because we had the will to pull people together and say, let us discuss these issues and let us make enough noise consistently to command the attention of those who must speak and who must act. I ask us today not to leave Paris without understanding that the bolstering of the political ambition that is required must secure transformation and not reform. And I ask us to ensure that those of us who are heads of government and heads of state recognize that the world cannot continue in the shadow of an old imperial order that does not see countries does not feel countries, does not hear countries, and worse, does not see, feel, or hear people. I ask us today to recognize that we cannot come to Paris, but let our directors go back to the IMF or the World Bank and it be business as usual. They do not act in their own interests. They act on behalf of our sovereign states. And that is why we speak not only to the need for money, we speak to the need for the reform of the governance systems. Because when these institutions were founded, our countries did not exist. And we speak for a complete transformation of securing the sources of capital, as unpopular as it might be to voice it. We do not ask for the bankruptcy of private companies. That's not our wish. But we do ask for everybody to share the burden so that we can share the bounty. And it therefore means that simply relying and holding only governments accountable has run its course. And what is necessary now is for us to bring to the table also multinational corporations whose balance sheets dwarf more than two thirds of the world's states. That is the world we have created out of the last century. And if we don't recognize that they cannot be left out of the equation, I'm coming. <laughs> if they don't recognize that we cannot be, they cannot be left out of the equation, then we have no desire to solve the problem. And we thank philanthropy for what they do, but it can only be what they like. It has to be what the world needs. And I hope that we leave Paris, therefore, not only secure in our determination to protect the planet, to protect the biodiversity, to protect people, but to recognize that if we do not act today at scale, with pace, we will not be able to get there in time to save more people. Let us, as the representatives of our people, at this most unique time in the history of civilization, not only do the right thing, but do it in time, and do it for the right reasons. We will have more time in the next day and a half to discuss the details. But my plea simply now is to step up the pace and let's get going. Thank you. Imperialism, a term that evokes images of conquest, 
domination and exploitation. But what exactly is imperialism and how has its legacy shaped the world we live in today? To understand imperialism, we must first delve into its origin. Stemming from the desire for power, wealth and territorial control, imperialism manifested as the domination of one nation over another, often through military force and economic exploitation. From the European colonial empires of the 19th century to the expansionist policy of Asian civilizations, imperialism has left an indelible mark on human history. The consequences of imperialism were far-reaching, affecting not only the colonized people but also the socio-economic and political landscape of entire regions. Imperialism facilitated the extraction of resources from colonized lands, enriching the colonial powers at the expense of indigenous populations. However, imperialism did not go unchallenged. Resistant movements and anti-colonial struggles emerged, driven by a desire for independence, self-determination and sovereignty. Imperialism was a form of oppression that sought to subjugate and exploit our people, but we refused to be mere subjects, we fought for our rights and our dignity. In the aftermath of decolonization, the legacy of imperialism continued to revibrate, shaping global power dynamics and foiling conflict and inequality that persist to this day. The boundaries drawn by colonial powers, the legacy of divide and rule policies, and the uneven distribution of resources continue to perpetuate instability and injustice in many parts of the world.